I know this is a, a topic near and dear to both of our hearts. I think we we both hold it in high importance. I think we realize uh, the impact that it has or vice versa, the negative impact it will have if you're not able to execute this. Um, I'm sure we go about it different. So this is one I've been excited to have for a while. Uh, the topic is disarming the prospect. And so we are not talking about firearms here, uh, not a physical disarming, uh, but I guess let's start it off for anybody that doesn't know, like in your view, what is disarming the prospect? What does that mean? Yeah, good question. And we may have different answers here, but look, I, we talk a lot about beliefs and behaviors that we need to carry on a sales call as salespeople. But I think there's a lot of beliefs and behaviors that a prospect will typically carry into a sales call as well. I mean, we're all aware of the, the carry, and I mention this all the time, but it's such a factor in what we do. But we're all aware of the caricature negative stereotype of, of salespeople, you know, all those yeah. things that we've said in the past. Pushy, aggressive, needy, self-centered, egotistical, uh, not listening, pitching, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the whole reason why every time we walk into a retail store and they say to us, can I help you? We say, no, just looking, you know, we do it ourselves uh, because we don't want to be smothered. We don't want to be pressured. We don't want to feel that we're not in control of a situation. So, you know, my belief is very much that a significant percentage of prospects come into a sales call, you know, feeling and behaving with some or all of those characteristics more often than not. So the idea, you know, that, that creates buyer resistance and it creates resistance to, to true rapport. It creates resistance to the truth being unveiled. It creates resistance to them being vulnerable and, you know, really opening up as to their realities and, and their fears and concerns and desires, which are all the things we need if we're going to have a decent chance of, of making a sale here. So in simplistic terms, it's to create a situation and an environment where most, if not all of those things go away. Uh, and then we end up having a as close to possible a, a true human interaction where nobody feels that the other person has a, an agenda to to get them, so to speak. Uh, mm. And we just have an honest conversation. And where that goes, well, that will be determined further in the call. So that's how I see it. What about you? Yeah, I really like, you know, you've brought it up on many calls and, and in private conversations, but I love that everything is centered around the truth. Like, what is the truth here? What is the optimal decision? What is the best move forward? What, you know, what is the best intention? Um, and I think when I think of disarming the prospect, like it's, it's a very powerful word to me, like disarming is very uh, aggressive. But when I think of just that word disarming, really, if I break it down, I'm thinking of removing the aspects that might potentially harm. Right? Like if we're dis disarming a bad guy, basically we're taking their gun away because that, that is the thing that could cause harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and based on what you've said, like to me, the harm is the bias. The harm is the suspicion or hostility that could get in the way of the prospect making the best decision possible. Mm -hmm. I want to disarm them from having those things that can be hurtful to me or hurtful to them. Right? and create a kind of an atmosphere that the best intentions, the truth, whatever you, however you want to phrase it, where we can just remove the things that kind of the baggage that we bring to calls. Right? And I do it with myself, like disarming myself before a call, I'll, I'll get into it and, and think like, what is my job here? And I always come back to being able to facilitate the best decision possible for both parties. And right? mm -hmm. that's how I've always looked at it. And so I have to remind myself, right, not to, my job's not to sell, my job's not this, job's not that. And so I'm disarming myself and bringing myself to that kind of a safe place for us to organize information. And I think, you know, as you said, the prospect brings in these experiences or, you know, misconceptions. And our job is to allow them to leave those at the door. Um, and create a space where we can exchange information and ideas to hopefully come up with the best outcome possible. Yep. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting. You, it's interesting that when you hear the word disarm, for you that sounds or feels like a like a strong or an aggressive word. I I actually have the opposite approach, and this could be due to uh, again I'm going to show my age, but probably the first time I heard the word disarm was 
in a Smashing Pumpkin song back in the early 90s, <laughs> again, showing my age. And uh, the line there was disarm you with a smile. So I, you know, it's probably their biggest hit back in the day. So I've always associated disarming in the context that I think about it as, as being quite subtle and quite, quite gentle. Um, so it's just an interesting observation. And I think I carry yeah. that belief into how I, quote unquote, disarm uh, at the start of the call. It is subtle. It is gentle. It is nurturing. It is giving. Um, it's certainly not. And I know you didn't imply this, but it's certainly not no. forceful. And I'm not no. pulling them to no, the ground, no. and, uh, pulling the gun out of their holster. Uh, and I know you didn't mean that. But um, no. for me, for me, the art of disarming on a sales call is in the space that I was touching on then. It is subtle. It is gentle. It is nurturing. Um, it is showing vulnerability sometimes from our end. Um, an example of that is asking them to tell you no if they don't feel it makes sense or ticks the boxes or just doesn't sit right with them. You know, I'm showing vulnerability by saying, hey, I'm aware that you might say no on this call and I'm okay with it. Um, yeah. And that would mean that I don't make a sale and you're probably sitting there thinking you sold my primary objective. I've just shown you that it's not. Um, so that's that's how I look at it. You know, Really, it's the primary objective I have in the first five minutes of the call yeah. is really to disarm them. Uh, more than anything else, uh, it's really to get them to that place where i can sense that they're now easing into the call i can sense that their defenses are coming down um then the real conversation starts yeah yeah i think you know definitely uh i grew up in a police household brothers dad you know whole family cousins everybody uncles and so that was probably my first introduction to it but i agree 100 percent um, and even in that context, right? Like I remember I, I used to be a bouncer um, at kind of nightclubs and bars and it would get a little rowdy. And I, I started to realize then that we have this idea of a bouncer, right? As being mm -hmm. this tough guy that's ready to fight and throwing people out. And I've always been quite observant. And I noticed that most of the conflict was happening with new bouncers. Mm -hmm. And I started looking at what the difference was between the veteran bouncers who never seemed to have any trouble and the new bouncers who every night were getting into some sort of problem. And what I realized was it was treating hostility or combating hostility with hostility. Mm -hmm. right? And so as someone would show signs of being coming hostile or being a problem, Right. The, the newer bouncers would kind of panic and react and they would bring a lot of negative attention to them and it would escalate where from the, the posture to the way people like the, the older veteran bouncers talk to the way they walked instead of running up to a conflict to how they held their hands to, you know, the, the use of humor. Uh, they were able to avoid these conflicts and, and get people on their side. And I think just because a situation is hostile or someone comes in with the idea that we're scum or we're liars or we're used car salesmen in bad suits, like just because there's hostility doesn't mean that we have to be reactive to mm -hmm. it in that way or it doesn't mean it. we have to be the total opposite. We have to be able to bring the energy into the call that we want to receive on the other end as well. So I think that's a really important note. Um, yep. Yeah, so I guess one of the things that I was thinking about today was I see a lot of like, we talked about principles versus tactics uh, mm -hmm. last week. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems I think I see with, with a lot of disarming or removing resistance training is again, it's no one has a deep understanding. It's just what to say. Here's the question that's going to remove it. Yep. And if you don't have a deeper understanding of this process, I feel like what I'm seeing a lot is that blend of persuasion and ma manipulation. And so one problem I have with people using disarming tactics is it's misleading in that they want people to trust them, but they're keeping the same intentions. So they're, they think their job is to sell everybody. Their mm -hmm. intention is to sell at all costs, mm -hmm. but they're using persuasion tactics to basically make the person feel like they can be trusted. And I have a real problem with that. I've always said like persuasion and 
manipulation are so close. And really the only difference is our intention behind it. If mm -hmm. I say something to give you a little push in the right direction, because I want you to be healthy and happy and, and maybe I'm persuading you to come to the gym with me, right? My intention is, is pure for you, mm -hmm. right? If I'm doing it for me, all of a sudden it becomes manipulation. And yep. so have you, what have you noticed or maybe you have, maybe you haven't, have you noticed anything that you feel conflicted with when people are talking about disarming or removing resistance? Um, not necessarily because I, I, I'm not, and this might be me just missing it, but I'm not seeing a lot of people out there talking about it. It might be out there, but it seems like, uh, without wanting to sound egotistical, it seems like most of the conversations where it comes up, I probably bring it up. So it's not, um, I'm not, I'm not able to make a judgment on how others are using it because I really don't know how they're using it and I haven't really heard them talk about it. So I can't give you a great answer there. What about you? It sounds like you might have something in that space. Yeah, I, I have my finger on the pulse. Uh, I, I think that they lean a lot on, so there's a big push on res, removing resistance, removing resistance. And, yep. and I, to me, that's always only been half the battle. If yep. I remove resistance, I'm starting at zero. Yes. My goal is receptivity. I want to be receptive because yep. that's, that's, the biggest part of communication yep. right, is the, the ability to present information in a way that it's received yep. and be able to receive information, even if yep. it's not the desired information you want. Right? And so that was always half the battle. And I never put a strong focus on like, okay, all I have to do is remove resistance. I have to focus on receptivity. And then I guess the other challenge that I'm seeing when they're talking about disarming, it typically falls into two categories, what to say, to disarm everybody, that one magic statement that disarms the whole world. Mm -hmm. And two, how you say it, the tonality, right? Tonality is kind of that golden goose that everybody goes to of like, oh, just because you say something a certain way, all of a sudden, you know, this person, this stranger is just going to be open to your every word. Um, and so, yeah, that's, those are the things I've noticed, but you're right. It has, it's not talked about enough and, and yeah. the context I've seen it in is not, super helpful because people don't have a deeper understanding or an empathy for the other person coming on, on the call. I think there's two things you said then, which I want to touch on. Um, look, there's no one size fits all in anything in sales. So um, the, the final point you made then, I can't think of anything that's one size fits all regarding sales. I mean, that's the art of selling is to understand who you're speaking to and, and their story and, you know, what type of voice and animation and energy will, give the best chance of getting to a good place in the call, you know, so there's no one size fits all. There might be an exception in some, some areas, but I can't think of any right now. Um, and in terms of the earlier point that you made, um, which was, is it the goal? I mean, it's really just one step of many. So the goal of the call is not just simply to disarm them. That's an, I mean, you could disarm them in the first five minutes, but that doesn't mean they're going to buy from you. You haven't even started talking about real stuff yet. All you've done is put them in a state where they're now easing into the call, their defenses are coming down, they're starting to build some sort of trust uh, or, or belief that you might be somebody who has pure intentions um, and that then encourages the likelihood they'll open up. But we haven't actually started to ask some questions yet about their situation. I mean, clearly they're only going to buy from us if you know they recognize that they have a problem or a need or a desire which aligns with what we can actually provide and said desire is strong enough that they actually want to do something about it um, and they want to do something about it now and they don't have any better alternative than for us to help them whether that's to do it themselves or to have someone else help them so we haven't even started talking about that stuff yet so um, there are a lot more objectives of course than just disarming my my overarching point would be the rest of the conversation will go so much better if you could spend the first five or so minutes in a natural way, um, not in a way where they become aware of what you're doing. Um, going back to what you were talking about last week when they gave you the same cam response with everything that you said to them, pretty yeah. quickly the prospect's going to become aware of what you're doing and that's always a bad thing on a sales call. So it needs to feel natural. It needs to feel organic. It needs to feel tailored towards this particular person. They shouldn't realize it. Um, they should just be sitting there thinking, okay, this guy or girl, um, you know, they – they're starting to get me. They, they seem reasonable. Um, so far I'm enjoying this conversation. I don't feel I have anything to fear. They've already told me 
I can tell them no. You know, they've already asked me to tell them, you know, this isn't right for me if it's not right for me. So that were my main fears that he would pressure me to say yes or he would make me buy no matter what, back me into a corner. Yeah. I've already had those fears removed. So what have I got to fear now? So let's just ease into the call and then away we go. So it's really not that hard, but it is only the first step of many. And I would encourage those that embrace this concept to consider focusing the first five or so minutes of the call on it. And then you're going to find the rest of the call goes so much better once you've done that. Well, that's yeah, been my experience anyway. 100%. And I, I want to make, a, I think, a distinction that, that's really important for me anyway. My job is not to remove skepticism or critical thinking. I actually want a decent level of both. I think skepticism especially gets a bad name. Uh, skepticism is actually, uh, for most people, a great way of thinking. I think they mix it up with cynicism. So, so skepticism is not is basically the idea of just not accepting everything you hear as the the whole truth and and just never challenging ideas, looking for information. We talked quite a few calls back about you know, emotion versus logic. And the skepticism is basically the idea that, okay, I feel this, but I also want to see it backed in logic. I want facts. I want case study. I want to see that this is alignment with what is being said. And so I think welcoming a healthy level of skepticism is important. I think we should, you know, the only people who are against, you know, critically thinking buyers or skeptic buyers are the ones who are typically misleading them. Uh, if if what you're saying is in alignment with what you're doing, and, and in fact, you do believe that this is the best decision possible, it should be in total alignment. And so there should, you know, skepticism will only help your cause because the more questions they ask, the more they dig, the more the information they're going to find out that is beneficial to them. I totally agree. I mean, cynicism is always taking the negative angle on more or less anything. They're out to get me. You're out to rip me off, you know. Whereas skepticism, as you said, I consider myself a skeptic. I mean, I understand sales and marketing. I, I can see, not always, but most of the time I can see what's going on with an ad or with copy or on a sales call. Um, and I'm aware that most of the time the motive is to, you know, have me take my wallet out and get my card out and do a transaction. Um, and therefore I have to keep myself in check. Otherwise I might get caught up in the moment. So I would consider myself a skeptic in most instances, but once the... Once the validation and verification uh, is there, you know, I can't live all of my life like that. Otherwise, I do become a cynic, uh, which I don't want to become and I'm not one. But, you know, a healthy little level of skepticism is totally fine. And and a great way to handle that is, you know, I talk a lot about, and this is one way to disarm as well, which is to kill elephants in the room as early as possible. You know, you can, you can say what you suspect they're thinking or what most people on these calls think, which might be, you know, and you can use it kind of... Um, you could use Chris Voss style in the way you deliver it. But, you know, if uh, if I'm looking to come into your um, your mastermind, uh, Undeniable Closer, and I, and I don't really know you, you know, and you're selling to me, you might say something like, you know, I get the feeling that you're going to tell me that you're sitting here looking at our mastermind program and thinking it's like every other guru-based high-ticket sales course that's out there. And I might actually be thinking that. Because at the moment, I don't know who JD is and I don't know what his program's about. And I might say, yeah, you're right. I, I actually am. Then you can have that conversation. And yeah. you, because you brought it up, the salesperson, you are now owning the narrative. And in my view, with objections, it's always more powerful if the salesperson brings it up preemptively rather than responds, especially when it's at the end of the call, when the prospect brings it up. So you can actually use that skepticism to build trust. Because you can show that you have a degree of empathy and understanding as to what it probably looks and feels like from the prospect's ends right now and what boxes they need to tick off in order to feel that, you know what, my skepticism is not founded here. This is a legit course. This is a legit program. It is different. They seem like real people. Um, I like what they're doing. I think they can help me. I can afford what they're asking for. You know what? Let's do it. Let's buy. Um, so you can use that skepticism to your advantage. But the way to do that is to understand what the most likely areas they are skeptical in and where possible preempt it by bringing it up early in the conversation and then throwing it back to them to ask them how they feel about it or if that feels applicable or if that's something that's been going through their mind on the call. And more often than not, that'll be received really powerfully uh, yes. in a positive way. And then you kill that you kill that elephant in the room nice and early on the call. And that enables them to then build more, more trust in you because a typical scam artist, um, to go to the extreme of skepticism, 
they're, there's always exceptions, um, but they're probably going to try and hide the defects and try and, yeah. you know, whip you up into a state of animated excitement. And, you know, before you know it, you've parted with your cash and you five minutes later, you're like, what the hell happened to me here? Um, whereas we're not doing it that way. We're inviting the skepticism. We're welcoming it. We're saying we understand it. Let's talk about the areas that would make you feel that way. And what do you need to see or feel or hear or have demonstrated to you in order for it to be clear that, you know, there is no need to be skeptical and yeah. let them paint that picture. And then I think that's so important. Go. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off there. Tangent, tangent over. <laughs> no, I think, it, I think it's so important. The two words that stood out to me are understanding and empathy. It's meeting someone where they are. And so I've used the example of, you know, the street dogs, and I am not comparing prospects to street dogs. Um, but the idea of just having that awareness, having that understanding, that empathy, that if I go up to a street dog, I might be the best person in the, in the world. I might have a T-bone steak and have my bed open for them and be able to adopt them or whatever. But to what I represent, the cylinder shape represents danger to them based on their previous experience. And so having that patience, that understanding, that empathy is meeting them where they are and validating their experience. It's mm -hmm. not pretending that all great salespeople are great people and always tell the truth. We entered an industry where we've even had most salespeople have had an experience with salespeople that was undesirable, that, mm -hmm. that, you know, burnt the trust. And so it's just having that, if you're going to enter this industry and have any success at all, if you think you can do that without understanding your prospect, understanding the industry, understanding the market, understanding the journey of what they've been through up until now and being able to disconnect what you represent from who you really are. That for me is a big purpose in, in disarming is creating a space where we can work through some of those misconceptions. Yep. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm this person and I'm offended if you, it's, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. I'm, I feel the same way when I get on call, I'm looking for the lies and the misconceptions I'm looking, you know, I'm, I'm probably more critical early on a call. I'm looking for the errors. And the beautiful thing about it in psychology is like, there's actually an appreciation and admiration for flaws. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when everything, I remember like when I was 22 or 23, I just like, I had been through that experience. I had so many reps that my sales process, my pitch was just smooth. It was just silky, right? And I started noticing my performance going down. And one thing that I thought was in really interesting, and Chris Voss talks about this a little bit as well. So shout out to Chris Voss. Mm -hmm. um, but I started getting the response of, hey, you're really good at what you do. And if you're hearing that as a salesperson, ugh, like you it's know over. you need to change. It's over. It's game over. They're telling you you're a really great salesperson, yeah. but I don't trust you. I'm not connected to you. I think you're good with words and placement and tone. And so the analogy is, right, I can see the actor in the movie. Yep. I'm not getting lost in the care. It's like I know that person is acting. And so it was like I had to kind of break down and create – natural flaws in the sales process so people thought i was human and so little example is instead of saying you know oh i'm in i've been in sales for 17 years da, 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 right i say you know I've, I've been in sales for geez going on 17 years now because mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. That's the thought process. That's mm -hmm. the human in me thinking about the time. But when we go through these reps 300 times, you know, in every two days, it starts to become automatic and we start to create resistance from just being too smooth and unnatural. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. I don't, this, this is an, this sounds counterintuitive to a lot of people and it sounded counterintuitive to me in the past as well. And you, you basically just touched on this, but, we don't want to be, we don't want to come across as the smartest guy in the room. We don't want to come across as too polished. We don't want to come across as too perfect. We don't want to come across as uh, a know-it-all with all the amazing answers. Um, excuse the dogs in the background. Yeah, um, good. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, part of being a good salesman does have a degree of acting in it. 
Now, it doesn't mean that we become a person that doesn't align with our morals uh, and our code of conduct, but it can mean that there are moments where, you know, we do scratch our head and we do, you know, ponder for a moment and we do maybe start and then stop a sentence or stutter a touch in order to, you know, to pattern interrupt, to break that feeling of I'm speaking to a Polish guy who's given this answer a hundred times before. Um, because again, as you said a moment ago, if we're being complimented or congratulated on our sales craftsmanship on a call, I can't ever recall getting a compliment like that. I've had them and getting a sale at the same time. Uh, it's always been something like, Michael, you're great at what you do. Um, amazing call, but uh, I can't do it today because ABC. Um, anytime I start to hear a compliment, I'm like, okay, bad news is coming. Um, so I think I would encourage people and I've used Columbo as an example in the past and I've done a part yeah. post on him in the past as well. And that, you know, that was a detective show in the seventies. Um, and you know, he was, for those that haven't heard me say this before, he was a, a master, uh, murder case, um, solver for whatever better word. And he would always go into rooms. It was all high society. All of the murder cases were high society. And he was working class and gruff, smart, you know, smart as sharp as a tack. But his primary motive was to disarm um, the, the suspects because he was always speaking to the murderer who, you know, carried themselves as a high citizen. And he would spend all the time sort of stumbling and fumbling and, and you know, scratching his head and taking his hat off and pondering. It was all an act. And the killer question for him was always, he'd ask all these softball questions, softball questions, softball questions. He'd leave. The murder suspect would exhale. Thank God they're gone. He always would have left his umbrella or his hat or his bag. He'd come yeah. back two minutes later, knock on the door to ask for his umbrella. And they had, were now completely disarmed. And then he'd ask the killer question. And that killer question mm -hmm. at that moment unlocked the case. But there was a series of acting um and preparing for that killer moment and we have to do the same in our own way or it serves us well to do the same in our own way so i'm forever um starting sentences and losing train of thought i'm forever scratching my head looking around um saying good question i haven't been asked that one before but i have been um because ultimately that's going to further that's going to my primary objective is for the truth to emerge and yeah. by me acting and carrying myself this way could you argue it's a little bit dishonest or maybe a little bit but the bigger win is to find honesty overall so you know i'm looking to win the war which means i might lose a battle or two um and part of that i actually had this in a, i was helping a, a sales pro yesterday and we talked about this exact tactic part of it is to prevent them from losing faith as well um and sometimes that might mean and this ties in with, with vulnerability and allowing them to open up further. Hence, another way of saying disarming. Sometimes we have to protect them from losing face by outsourcing responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. Or sometimes we have to take responsibility, even though it was them. So I might have told you three times on this call, JD, could you please, um, I don't know, take your earphones out. And on the fourth time, even though I've asked you three times and you're still not doing it, I might say, look, it's probably my fault. I probably wasn't speaking clearly. We both know I was speaking clearly, but in order for you not to lose face and to increase the chance you'll actually take the earphones out, I'll take the I'll be the fall guy here and and yeah. ultimately lose face because that that increases the chance that you'll actually take them out this time rather than pick a fight by saying I haven't heard you say it once and now we're yeah. now we're fighting. So that can be another tactic that can be used to disarm them. It's it's. Um, you know, creating situations where they don't lose face by being honest and vulnerable, yeah. whether that's outsourcing it to a third person or a situation, it's not your fault because the system doesn't allow people like you to blah, 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 or it's not your fault. I probably didn't speak clearly earlier, even though I did. Um, so things like that and other, are other tactics that can be really good to uh, increase trust um, and have them open up and have their defenses come down. And with all those things in play, we are moving further along, getting them to a point where, once again, the truth can emerge. Yeah, I think that's so important. To me, that's that's a principle of leadership, is being able to take on the things that are, you know, allow the space or the ownership of a problem or these ideas for the greater good. Right? It's that, you know, I don't want anybody feeling stupid on a call. I don't want them feeling attacked. I'm more than willing to take that on the chin um, so that we can create that space. And so I think for me, it, it comes down to a level of humbleness about removing ego 
uh, and about vulnerability. For me, one of one of my greatest sales tool on a call is vulnerability. I, I purposely am vulnerable on every call. I, I insert, it's different each time, but I insert something I'm not good at or something I've struggled with or mistakes I've made or, you know, a, a thought that's changed of I used to think this, but now I think that. And, mm. you know, that that creates space because, again, the, the psychology behind it, we it's kind of the crabs in a bucket scenario is, you know, human nature is as we as people start to climb, as they start to raise up, whether that's in success or, you know, that pedestal feeling, um, people who feel like they lack the control to rise with you will likely try and find a way to bring you down. Right? And so the defense against that is humbleness. The defense of that is you know, I'm no better or no worse than anybody else. I am flawed. I make mistakes. I We are equals here. Every time I enter a sales call, I go in as equals. Uh, I feel that it's important for them to listen to what I have to say. I think it's important for me to listen to what they have to say. There's, there's, I may lead the conversation, but, you know, I'm not coming in from an ego standpoint that I know so much more than them. Um, you know, I've been, I've had more experience with a specific offer or I've been more introduced. We have a lot of the answers going in and we forget that sometimes that there was a moment before we started the campaign where we didn't have any of this information and it was hand delivered. It wasn't mm -hmm. like we were born with this or our class of humans, you know, we have it and someone doesn't. It's, we were introduced to it and now it's our job to introduce people to the, the right information. So I think that's, that's really important. And so I guess in the, the last little bit of this call, do you want to share some of the secret sauce or, or a little bit of how you, I know you really focus on that first five minutes. Yep. Um, do you want to give some tips or tricks or ideas of the how be, behind the what? Sure. Well, in simplistic terms, if I were to put it into one sentence, it's, it's act, behave, present yourself in a way that is the opposite of the caricature salesperson. Um, because their their fears are that the caricature salesperson is waiting for them at the other end, the guy that's going to put yeah. pressure on them, the guy that's going to be salesy, the guy that's going to back them in a corner and use their words against them. I thought you said this was important, you know, things like that. Um, so that's what they're scared of. They're probably also scared that they can't afford it as well. Um, so hence, you know, not to go off on another tangent, but I like to kill all the elephants in the room nice and early on a call, which is you don't have to say yes to me today. I do expect an answer and and... There's a whole way I handle that, which I, is too big to go into right now. Yeah. But I do make it clear that, you know, at the end of the call, we're going to take a decision either way. It's okay if it's no. But if it's yes, then let's get to work. Um, you know, give them an out. At any stage, say to them, you know, do you still want to keep doing this call? Uh, or have we already scared you off? You know, bring a little bit of sort of light humor into it. And then they'll say, no, no, you haven't scared me off. And then, um, you know, again, they're feeling they're in control because I'm always giving them outs, which is counterintuitive to how many people sell. They want to... state of excitement uh and positivity and avoid the opposite of all of those things i'm the opposite there's more reasons why people won't buy than they will so let's talk about the reasons nice and early why this might not make sense for you or be possible for you and then if we're still talking in five minutes time well then we'll map out you know if this makes sense and feels right and if it does we'll probably do something and if it doesn't then we won't you know talking to people in that sort of language tailored to your way i find is very disarming uh, because it's it's not what most people sell. It's not how most salespeople talk. And it's always being respectful that, you know, this is your decision to make. I'm not here to pressure you or to persuade you or to pitch to you. I'm here to see if it makes sense for us to help you. If it does, we can talk about specifics. And if it doesn't, because you either don't need it or you don't want it, or it becomes clear you got a better alternative, then you're going to tell me no. And we're going to part the call as friends and we're going to have a great day after that. Yeah. When you speak language yeah. like that in your version of, In my experience of the prospect of my video uh and it's a much better conversation so in simplistic terms carry yourself different to the caricature salesperson kill the elephants in the room nice and early give them outs along the way make them fight to be on the call they're the ones with the problem not us so you know if this problem is important enough to you and i sound and look like the sort of person that you want to keep talking to to explore if i can maybe help you then let's do it but if it becomes clear that that's not the case then let's end the call and part as friends yeah
No, I think that's important. It comes back to something you said early on, which is it's not about making them believe something in a bait and switch. It's about getting to the truth. And the truth is that you are expecting a decision and yes and no are, are equal opportunity. And, you know, this is what we're here to do. This, you have a problem. We have a potential solution and we're going to see if those align. And so for me, it's, it's always, it's not about telling them something I want them to believe. It's showing them what is actually truth and getting them to connect with that. And so you mentioned it early in the call, but I believe that first impressions definitely shape a conversation. There's a, a first impression bias um, and we are judgmental. I always laugh when people say, oh, I'm not judgmental. It's like, well, how do you get through life? If someone's coming down the street with a, a butcher knife, are you going to assume that at 3 a.m. that they're just a butcher that is, you know, walking that's, down the street? We, we need to. That's, that's a, a survival tactics. Such a ridiculous statement. That doesn't stand yeah. up to any scrutiny whatsoever. No, our brain is constantly judging situations. Whether you act on those judgments is is really what makes us human. But True. the ability to like not have judgments is crazy. And so how I focus on it um, is really what is the truth. And the truth is that we are different. And mm -hmm. that is one of the things that is going to be a block that gets in the way of the truth. If they think I'm the same as every other guru or the experience, I know, again, understanding and empathy for my prospects is they've probably been through a training that they're not so excited about or they felt like they were misled. So I know my audience. And so my first goal is to show them, not tell them, but tell them first, but show them secondly, that I am different, that this is different, that UCM mm -hmm. is different, that the whole experience is going to be different to allow them to relax. And then by planting those seeds, what they're going to do, right? Just like if I bought a white Honda Civic, tomorrow I go out, all I see is white Honda Civics. If mm -hmm. I plant the seed of difference early on, that subconsciously or consciously, the prospect is going to be looking for proof of how we are different, mm -hmm. right? And so the first thing I do is I tell them that they are going to likely notice that we do things quite differently here. Mm -hmm. It's not something I say, it's, it's, it's the truth. But that's not enough. Like I said, I have to show them that we are different. So in the beginning of every call, I start by discussing why someone shouldn't join us. I know that's different, right? Mm -hmm. What roadblocks prevent someone who wants to join us mm -hmm. and not being able to, like you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, someone may think we're the best thing since sliced bread. If they have $4 to their name, that's mm -hmm. the end of the road for now. Mm -hmm. right? And then also why we might choose not to work with someone. And I think that's an important factor because yep. I think, again, one of the misconceptions of people come in, right, is that, you know, this person's going to convince me to say yes. And I hold all the power of if I say yes, then all they want is my credit card. Yep. Uh, I know this is a unique scenario, but we, you know, I've turned down many people and will continue to do so if I don't feel an alignment, if I don't feel like they add to the community, if I don't want to spend, I spend a lot of time with each person. And so if I don't want to spend my time, my most valuable asset, right? I have to decide that because once I commit to someone, I go all in and commit to them fully. And so I have to kind of work some of those impulses. You touched on one impulse that I think is really important and it's indifference, right? Not indifferent to the person, but mm -hmm. indifferent to the selfish outcome, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, we all want more sales. There's not a person on the planet that doesn't want more sales, mm -hmm. but I have to be disconnected to that, that idea of like, Ideally, I want the sale, but mm -hmm. that's not what I'm here to do. I mm -hmm. trust the process overall that mm -hmm. if I show up and have enough of these conversations and I trust in the marketing and the company to deliver the right people and I work on you know, myself as being able to facilitate decisions at a high you know, output, then I know the rest will work out maybe not on this call or the next, but overall it will work. So indifference, not from the person, not from, you know, the desire, but the basically the indifference from your selfish outcome or your desire of what's going to happen on this call, what's the best case scenario for you? Yep, yep, yep. Fo focusing on the process as opposed to pinning all of your energy and hopes on achieving a certain outcome. Um, doing that is both counterintuitive or counterproductive towards getting a sale because your interests are in making the sale at whatever cost. And that means that you will carry yourself differently and they will probably start to sense that. And before you know it, you're a typical salesperson. And this whole call has been about not being a typical salesperson. Um, and it's also a recipe for burnout as well, because 
you're going to try to sell to everybody when a true pro, you know, would have picked up, I don't know, 10 of the last 20 people you spoke to, a true pro could have picked up who didn't buy. A true pro could have picked up 95% of those in the first five minutes, thus having a dignified uh, and polite early exit with energy and self-respect and uh, lack of frustration. Whereas the guy that tries to close everybody, because that's all I'm here to close, um, no matter what, and we'll end this call with you either hanging up on me uh, or, or a sale, basically. And I've yeah. been in sales roles like that before. The, My God, the buyer die yeah. mentality. Yeah. Um, that's a one-way ticket to unhappiness, to burnout, to frustration, to resentment, and you're just being a typical sales guy. And um, that basically is my kryptonite, to be a typical sales guy um, yeah. in this space. Uh, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be perceived as that person. And I've come to learn because I was that in the past. So, I, you know, this comes from experience. I've come to realize there's a more effective way uh, in, in all aspects, more effective in terms of getting better quality sales, more sales, and having all that extra time and energy because you have learned how to disqualify people nice and early who are either unsuitable um, from our end or unsuitable in the sense that what they're looking for or need doesn't align with what we do uh, or they're incapable of saying yes even if they wanted to because they're broke and they have no resources and that's fixed uh, or they're just not yet at a stage where they can move forward even if they wanted to for whatever reason. If you can identify that nice and early, you will keep your sanity in check and you will potentially set yourself up for a long career doing this as opposed to burning out, you know, six to 12 months of being resentful and all those negative emotions, which I never want to go back to. Yeah, 100%. I think for anybody listening, that's an important place to start is figuring out what the truth is. Like, what are we here to do? What is the best intention for this prospect? You know, how can we serve them? to the best of our ability. And it's, it's one of those things that should never be faked. It should never be coming at a, you know, I'm going to say this because then they'll think this way, but actually it's not like the, you'll find that you have to focus much less on tactics. Cause I've seen people who don't know the tactics, but they're very disarming because they have true intentions and they're able to communicate that. And so you have to focus very little on tactics if you actually come from a place where you believe that your job is to facilitate the best decision, where you are there to serve the prospect, where you don't care so much about this individual sale. Like when you come at it, what you'll find is the way you communicate, the way you talk, the questions you ask, the presence, the connection, you'll just have this natural disarming ability. And then of course, as you have more experience, you'll start to notice like, oh, I noticed this person came in and was very aggressive. Then I can start working on some of the tactical stuff. If I feel like uh, just my natural ability is causing resistance, right? Then I can start looking at some tactical stuff. But I would say as far as a beginner's guide, like just get into the mindset of the things that we talked about here today. And what you'll notice is people will just, naturally become a little bit more or a little less resistant, a little bit more receptive. Mm -hmm. And then, cause if you, if you smell like a salesperson, it doesn't really matter what tactics you approach or, you know, what you say, I see, you know, coaches always, I've seen the crazy stuff. Like if you wear this, you'll become three X more persuasive. It's ridiculous, right? Like changing your shirt is not what's going to change the prospect's mind. It's, if they can sense, you know, the idea of real recognizes real, if they can sense that genuine interest, right, they're going to be much more receptive. Mm -hmm. Yep. What do you think, Michael? Should we call it a day? I think this has been a long one. I hope that those watching got some value from it. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're at a, a natural end point right now. I don't have anything else to say on the topic. Beautiful. Well, as always, I appreciate you. If you have any questions for me and Michael, you know, light up the chat. If you have any topics for the next one, um, anything that you'd want to hear us talk about, uh, we're more than open to it, but we appreciate uh, everybody that takes the time out of their day um, to, to watch these and, and wish you all the best.